Good afternoon, everyone. Just a couple things here at the top, and we'll get right to your questions. Uh, Secretary Austin spoke by phone yesterday with Ukrainian Minister of Defense Rustem Umarov to discuss current battlefield dynamics, Ukraine's ongoing operations, and Ukrainian reconstitution and training efforts. During their call, Minister Umarov provided an update on the impact of Russia's continued attacks in Ukraine. Secretary Austin and the minister also discussed the next Ukraine Defense Contact Group meeting, which will be held next month, in support of Ukraine's urgent security assistance requirements. As we've said, since Russia's illegal and cruel invasion two and a half years ago, the DOD will continue to support Ukraine with the means to deter and defend itself against further Russian aggression. The full readout of the phone call is available on defense.gov. Separately, the Department of Defense continues to closely monitor the situation in the Middle East and take steps to mitigate the possibility of regional escalation by Iran or its proxies. The Department's recent adjustments to the U.S. military posture in the region have enabled us to bolster U.S. force protection, increase support for the defense of Israel, and to ensure the United States is prepared to respond to various contingencies. As you've heard us say previously, we remain intently focused on de-escalating tensions in the region while also remaining focused on securing a ceasefire as part of a hostage deal to bring all of the hostages home and to end the war in Gaza. With that, take your questions. We'll start with AP, Lita Baldor. Thank you, Pat. Um, two things uh, on Ukraine. One, have you or has the Pentagon seen any significant Russian movement back into Kursk at this point. Can you at least give us uh, some sort of broad assessment about what you're seeing, even if it's you're seeing nothing at all? And then I have a second question. Sure. Um, you, you know, again, without uh, getting into an, an operational update here, we have seen indications of Russia moving, uh, you know, a small number of forces uh, f uh, into Kursk. Uh, the Kursk region to respond. I would say, generally speaking, though, uh, Russia has really struggled to respond, uh, and you continue to see uh, some Ukrainian advances in that regard. Uh, but again, I'd, I'd refer you to uh, Ukraine to talk about its operations uh, and to Russia to talk about its own forces. And then secondly, um, did the Ukrainians ask anything or are they asking anything from the United States in order to help with the operation there? Is, are, they, are they asking for any specific uh, weapon systems or other support? Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to announce from the podium. As I mentioned, we'll be conducting the Ukraine Defense Contact Group here in September, uh, which again is always the opportunity to, to meet with our allies and partners to talk about Ukraine's most urgent defense needs. Uh, and as I highlighted, you know, we're committed to making sure they have what they need to uh, defend their sovereign territory uh, and deter future Russian aggression. Can I just put sort of on the record, could we please get an operational update? Noted. Thank you. Welcome back again, Lucas. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> General Ryder, how long do you plan to keep this additional firepower in the Middle East? Well, as you know, uh, we're, we're not going to talk about operational timelines. Um, we will preserve flexibility, as we always do. Uh, and again, we'll stay focused on the uh, operational objectives that I highlighted. What happened to as long as it takes, or is that just for Ukraine? You're talking about the Middle East? I'm about the Middle East, but I'm saying for Ukraine, you constantly say the mantra in this building is for as long as it takes. Is that the same uh, with the Middle East? Well. Again, Lucas, I, I know you've covered this region for a while. Um, we've had a, a significant force presence in the Middle East for a very long time, upwards of you know, 30,000 plus U.S. forces operating with partners throughout the region, uh, and I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. Are all options on the table with Iran? Uh, in what regard? I mean, all regard. Like, where do you want to start? Like, diplomatic, economic, informational? This building said there are all options are on the table in dealing with Iran. Does that include striking Iran? Are all options on the table? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into a philosophical discussion. I think we've been very clear in terms of we're focused on... Well, you're, you're providing a very broad scope getting into, you know... Uh, geopolitics and and so if you can define your question a little bit better yeah all options are on the table when dealing with person but let's go over here to will um regarding the forces the russian forces that have been moving into kursk are they from inside russia or any of them been pulled from ukraine or ukrainian front lines yeah i'm not going to have any further details to provide on that will 
Thanks. Charlie. Uh, thanks, Pat. In terms of the destruction of the Glushkovo Bridge, uh, the Russians are suggesting weapons, <coughs> Western weapons were used, possibly HIMARS. Are HIMARS being used in this fight? Uh, so I appreciate the question. Uh, again, I'm going to have to refer you to the Ukrainians to talk about their operations and, and what they are or not using. F-16s? Uh, again, I'd refer you to the Ukrainians to talk about what, what they're employing in their operations. So, Brett. Uh, so when the secretary spoke with the Ukrainian defense ministry yesterday, uh, did they discuss long-range strikes into Russia? And is the U.S. considering reversing that policy? Um, so I'm not going to be able to provide more detail than what we've included in our readout other than to say, you know, our, our policy when it comes to long range strikes has not changed. Thanks. Tony? I, I attack them in the cursed offensive. Does, do the Ukrainians have permission to use attack them to blunt a Russian counteroffensive into their, into the, the uh, pocket they've captured? So I'm not going to get into uh, Ukraine's selection of uh, capabilities as they conduct uh, their their operations. Our, our policy is has not changed, which is in terms of using uh, long range strike capabilities to conduct deep strike. You know, as you've heard us say, conducting counterfire defensive operations across the border is permitted. Uh, and I'll just leave it there. Quick question. Last, uh, last week you, you, were, uh, you took a question on Afghanistan in terms of over the horizon strikes. It was in the context of uh, ISIS-K. You didn't really elaborate on the extent to which since the pullout, uh, to the, since the withdrawal three years ago, the United States is conducting over the horizon either surveillance or strikes against ISIS-K elements. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that, the extent to which the United States is conducting those? Uh, well, generally speaking, Tony, you know, we're going to read out or at the appropriate time any type of strikes that we've taken. I'm, I'm not aware of any that we haven't announced at this point. Um, certainly, if we see imminent threats against the United States or our interests, we reserve the right to take appropriate action to include conducting over-the-horizon strikes. Uh, but I don't have anything to read out to you right now. Thanks. Thanks. Janie. Thank you, General. Two questions. Uh, the U.S. and South Korea UFS Ultimate Freedom Shield military exercise is underway in South Korea. North Korea accused uh, this exercise of uh, being aimed at invading North Korea. How will you react? Yeah, I mean, that's just patently false. Uh, as you know, these exercises are defensive in nature. Uh, they're also longstanding. Uh, and these are opportunities for our forces to work together on interoperability. Uh, and to learn how how to operate uh, in dissimilar environments. Last weekend, uh, the leaders of the United States and South Korea and Japan issued a joint statement uh, uh, commemorating the one-year anniversary of the Camp David Declaration. What will happen to the U.S. and South Korea and the U.S. and South Korea and Japan agreement if the United States administration changes? Um, well, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I'm not going to get into a hypothetical other than to say I think uh, our alliance with Japan and South Korea are, are strong, stronger than they've ever been. Uh, and I think going into the future, you'll see them continue to get even stronger. Thanks. Let me go to the phone real quick here. Take a couple. All right, let's go to uh, JJ Green, WTOP. Thank you, General, for taking this question. I had a chance to speak with a spokesman from the Ukrainian military a day or so ago, and they mentioned that uh, it would be very helpful for them if Western logistics, and speaking of the U.S. and the allies that are sending weapons, et cetera, to them, um, if the pace could be picked up to get those weapons to them sooner, considering what it is that they're doing and what they're engaged in now in Kursk and Belgorod, um, and just a second, really quickly, um, is this something that could be addressed at the next contact group, if not sooner? Yeah, thanks for the question, JJ. Um, we are always looking at ways that we can expedite delivery of capabilities uh, to the Ukrainians. And uh, to your point, the Ukraine Defense Contact Group provides uh, an excellent forum in which to have discussions, to look at uh, processes, procedures, uh, as it relates to um, ensuring that the Ukrainians have what they need on the battlefield to defend themselves. You know, it's important to remember, uh, first of all, that from the very beginning, 
the United States has worked very, very hard to rush uh, vital capabilities to Ukraine, and that hasn't stopped. You see organizations like the Security Assistance Group Ukraine, uh, which serves as a focal point for ensuring uh, the, the onward delivery of those capabilities, but also recognizing the incredible complexity, uh, more than 50 nations working together to, to get this capability uh, from their own stocks in often cases, or contracting it and getting it to Ukraine. So that is work uh, that is constantly ongoing, uh, and as evidenced by the fact that you continue to see Russian forces conducting offensive action in the, the east of Ukraine, uh, we also recognize the vital importance of, of moving as quickly as possible. So we'll stay after it. Let me go to Lara Seligman, Wall Street Journal. Laura, are you there? Hi. Can you hear me? Give us an update, Pat, on um, the F-16 training in Ukraine, how that is going, and um, whether there are going to be American contractors um, helping out with the maintenance in Ukraine. Yeah, so, so right now, uh, as I understand it, there continues to be uh, F-16 training in Arizona and, and in Denmark. Um, in terms of within Ukraine, I don't have any updates to provide. I'd have to refer you to the Ukrainians on that front. As you know, they, they have uh, received some F-16s. Um, and in terms of uh, DOD contractors, U.S. DOD contractors, I'm not aware of any right now. All right, come back and more. Uh, two questions in the Middle East and then one in Ukraine. Ha have the USS Abraham Lincoln or has the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group and USS Georgia arrived in CENTCOM? Uh, they're still in transit, Orn, uh, and we'll keep you updated on that front. But I do anticipate uh, they'll be arriving soon. So uh, I'm just curious, when you talk about bolstering U.S. force protection and, and increasing support for Israel, isn't it true then that most of what you're sending hasn't even gotten to the AOR yet? No, I don't, I don't think that would be a fair characterization. Again, uh, as I highlighted earlier, we already maintain uh, a significant force presence. And it's also important to understand to look beyond uh, episodic situations, right? So ensuring that we have the forces in theater uh, to respond to something if it happens now, but also ensuring we have forces in theater to be able to respond to whatever could be next in terms of potential escalation and trying to de-escalate the situation. And that requires uh, bolstering some of those capabilities. Again, one, to send a clear message, but two, to be able to respond uh, in a longer term scenario should we need to do that. So uh, I'll just leave it there. And then just a quick Ukraine question. Is the U.S. ready to openly and publicly support Ukraine's operation in Kursk? If not, why not? Um, look, again, uh, we're, we're continuing to have the discussions with the Ukrainians in terms of their, their focus. You heard President Zelensky say it was to create a buffer zone. So we're, we're having those conversations to learn more about what their objectives are. Again, if you take a step back from a U.S. perspective, our focus continues to be uh, enabling Ukraine to be a free and sovereign country that can deter Russian aggression in the future. Uh, and so that main, that continues to be our, our focus. Um, as it relates to their operation in Kursk, as I mentioned, uh, they, they clearly uh, have compelled the Russians to uh, struggle in their response. Uh, it has certainly uh, demonstrated the creativity uh, and the battlefield prowess of the Ukrainians. Uh, but when it comes to uh, what their longer term objectives are here, that's something that we're still discussing with them. Thank you. Sir. Uh, thank you seen very you in a while. Welcome back. Thank you very much, General. Actually, I was in Kurdistan. All right, welcome Many back. official sources, including Minister of Peshmerga, they told me ICE is a serious threat in Iraq, in Syria, and in the region. And he believed it is very important for whole of Iraq, international coalition, stay in Iraq. Do you have any comment of that? Um, well, as you know, the, the conversations uh, with the Higher Military Commission continue. I don't have any updates to provide on the, on the outcomes of that other than to say uh, that we, as part of the U.S.-Iraq Joint Security Dialogue, which includes uh, Peshmerga representation, uh, is looking at what the transition for the coalition OIR will be uh, and what the future of the U.S.-Iraq bilateral security cooperation is. When it comes to ISIS, uh, you're right. It does continue to be a threat. Certainly, ISIS is not uh, as 
uh, capable as it was 10 years ago, uh, but they do continue to pose a threat, particularly uh, in ungoverned spaces within Syria, uh, and also as it relates to uh, ISIS prisoners in Al-Hal that need to be repatriated. So this is something that uh, we are not going to take our eyes off of, uh, and we'll continue to keep you updated on that front. Following question. Do you believe cooperation between Peshmerga and Iraqi army is important to push back ISIS and especially in disputed area like Kirkuk? Yeah, look, there's no question, uh, first of all, that uh, Iraqi security forces uh, writ large, which includes uh, Peshmerga, have played a, a vital role in terms of uh, reducing the threat that ISIS poses. But as we've seen uh, in places like Afghanistan, left unchecked, uh, ISIS can start to make a resurgence. And so, again, we'll continue to work with uh, our Iraqi partners, uh, our Peshmerga partners, to address this threat. Let me go to Constantine and then I'll come to you, Carla. Thanks, Pat. Um, yesterday, President Zelensky was quoted in uh, Ukrainian media saying that he deliberately did not disclose plans of his um, Kursk uh, mission to Western allies. Is that something that the Pentagon, is, that dynamic is something that the Pentagon expects to be part of the relationship going forward? And is that a source of concern in this building? Well, you know, look, I think our commitment and support for Ukraine uh, is strong, right? And, and we're going to be continue to support them for the long haul, as you've heard Secretary Austin and others say. Um, we're going to always keep those channels of communication open because the better we understand uh, what Ukraine's objectives are, the better we can support them. And so this is why we have multiple mechanisms to include frequent phone calls between Secretary Austin and his counterpart and forums like the UDCG where, where we can have those discussions. But at the end of the day, uh, again, it's important to take a step back in terms of what we're trying to achieve here, and that's a, a free and sovereign Ukraine uh, that is able to defend itself and deter future Russian aggression. So just quick mm -hmm. follow-up, sorry. Uh, no, you would say that there's no change in the closeness of the relationship between Absolutely the Absolutely not. Okay. No. Thank you, Pat. A um, couple follow-ups. So follow-up <laughs> to uh, Oren's question. USS Georgia is still not in the CENTCOM AOR. Is that what it's you just said? It's in transit. In transit? Mm -hmm. It is heading towards the CENTCOM AOR? It's been ordered to the CENTCOM AOR. Why are you asking your, your question so incredulously? <laughs> it's, it's, it's taking them an awful long time to get there. That's why I'm just trying to, to track to make sure that it is indeed going to CENTCOM. Um, okay, just wanted to make sure. And then on, um, on Ukraine, just to follow up to Lita's question, um, there have been other attacks outside Kursk. Um, there was a drone attack that targeted uh, a fuel depot like 700 kilometers south of Kursk, about 250 kilometers away from the Ukrainian border. Uh, is that pulling <coughs> any Russian forces outside of Ukraine? Have you seen them, if they're not moving into Kursk, have you seen them pull back to Russia? What can you say uh, on how these attacks have updated um, and affected the battlefield in Ukraine? Yeah, you know, Broadly speaking, Carla, again, what you see is the vast majority of Russian forces along the, the eastern front in Ukraine um, occupying Ukrainian territory and, and focused on, uh, in some areas, on you know, largely defensive, but in some areas focused on uh, offensive operations attempting to take additional Ukrainian territory. Uh, as it relates to uh, any type of Ukrainian operations inside Russia that, that you're referencing, um, you know, that's inside Russia. So, I mean, they already have forces inside Russia. Um, I, I just don't have anything on that. All right, let me go back to the phone here. Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you. Uh, can you bring us up to date on the number of attacks and, uh, and wounded in Iraq and Syria against U.S. troops and also uh, can the Defense Department name which cruisers were sent uh, to the Middle East? I don't think I've seen those ships named. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, in terms of the uh, the injuries that were at uh, Rumal and Landing Zone, uh, I think you were briefed on Monday. Uh, Eleven personnel had been treated for TBI and smoke inhalation. All 11 of those, to my knowledge, have returned to duty. Um, in terms of the, the cruisers, um, just to clarify something. So within the Department of Defense, uh, we have an acronym that we typically use, CRUDES, which stands for Cruiser Destroyer. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there was some information out there in terms of 
uh, cruisers going to the AOR right now. There are no cruisers uh, in the AOR, uh, but we often use that term also loosely to re uh, refer to destroyers. So crew des, cruiser destroyer. So we do have destroyers in both the UCOM and the CENTCOM AOR. Hope th hopefully that helps to clarify. All right, let me go to uh, Joseph Alarbia. Thanks, Pat. I uh, just wanted to ask again on um, on Iraq. Today, Iraq's foreign minister said several developments led to the postponing of the announcement of the end of the coalition presence in Iraq. But he also said there had not been any response to the attacks on U.S. troops, particularly at Al Assad Air Base, due to what he said was diplomacy. Were you guys asked to hold off or not respond um, to any of these recent attacks, specifically the the most recent one that led to, uh, I guess, 11 injured uh, U.S. personnel. Yeah, thanks, Joseph. So uh, a couple of things on that. So uh, first of all, as Secretary Austin has said many times, we're not going to tolerate attacks on our forces. Uh, and uh, we will always uh, respond appropriately in a time and manner of our choosing. Uh, as for any type of diplomatic discussions, I, I don't have anything to read out to you, uh, nor am I going to get into uh, those types of private discussions. Okay, time for a few more. Yes, sir. Thank you, General Ryder. My name is Mushfiqul Fazal, representing South Asia Perspectives. How does the Pentagon view the role of the Bangladesh Army in supporting peace and stability under the interim government led by Nobel laureate Professor Muhammad Yunus? Is there any collaboration or communication between the United States and Bangladesh military during this transitional period? Um, well, as you know, we do have a, a defense relationship with Bangladesh. Uh, we will look forward to uh, working to support our shared values and interests, such as a free and open Indo-Pacific. I don't have anything to read out right now in terms of any types of contact. Uh, as it relates to uh, the Bangladesh government, of course, you know, we, we would expect uh, human rights uh, to be observed and, and there to uh, be an avoidance of any type of violence. Uh, but I would refer you to our State Department for any questions about the, the U.S.-Bangladesh relationship writ large. Thank you. Charlie. Uh, thanks, General. Between the Theodore Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, the ships that are in the Med now, I count around a dozen destroyers, a submarine that will one day get there. What kind of fight are you gearing up for? And, and so, first of all, let's be clear about, you know, I, I, I noted a bit of snarkiness in your question there, but uh, the submarine is in the Mediterranean, which is in the UCOM AOR. Okay, so first of all, I mean, it's in proximity of the region that we're talking about, moving into the central command region, again, to provide capa ca capacity there. And in terms of what we're getting ready for, um, is exactly what I read out at the top, which is enabling us to bolster force protection, the defense of Israel, and also be ready to respond to a wide variety of contingencies. I understand the focus on this moment in time, but we in the DOD are a planning organization, and in addition to be ready, being ready for now, we're going to be ready for that wide variety of contingencies of what may come. To do that, you have to have capability and you have to have capacity. And, and so that's exactly what we've done, and that's what we'll, exactly what we'll be prepared to do going ahead into the future. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yeah, President Zelensky said it wouldn't have been necessary for them to move into Kursk if its supporters, including the U.S., cleared them to launch deep strike missions at military targets inside Russia proper. Is this fair or not, or is this true or not? With the yeah, I'm, yeah I, I'm not going to uh, comment on President Zelensky's uh, statement, certainly, I, you know, I'll let his comments speak for themselves. Again, uh, there should be no question that the United States supports Ukraine and its fight for freedom and to preserve its sovereignty uh, and to deter future Russian aggression. And that's what we continue to remain focused on. Um, while you're going to see uh, various uh, shifts on the battlefield from time to time as we've been watching this for two and a half years we remain laser focused on that end state in terms of enabling them to defend their sovereignty uh, and deter future Russian aggression both urgent battlefield needs and long-term defense needs and that's what we'll continue to stay focused on ultimately at the end of the day 
you know, it's up to the Ukrainians to defend their country, and we're going to continue to communicate closely with them on what those needs are uh, and evolve as the situation on the battlefield evolves. All right. Last two. Yes, sir. Thanks, General. Um, so on the two major wars that are going on in Ukraine and in Gaza, um, the civilian casualty rate in Ukraine by the Russian military is around 11,000 civilians, around 2,000 children. Uh, in Gaza, it's 40,000 civilians, uh, 16,000 children. So that's eight times the number of children killed in one third of the time span by Israel. So my question for you is if you could tell us about the moral calculus that has led this administration to spend over $100 billion supporting Ukraine to fight back against Russia while we're spending tens of billions aiding militaries, aiding Israel's military campaign in Gaza and using rhetoric, you know, like Russia's aggression, defending Israel, we're getting ready to defend Israel for a regional war potential in the Middle East. So um, with that stark civilian casualty contrast, why have you determined that Russia is the bad guy and Israel is the good guy? Uh, so again, let's let's take a step back in time here and look at how these conflicts started. Number one, uh, Russia's illegal, cruel invasion, February of 2022, um, essentially attacking its democratic sovereign neighbor unprovoked. October 7, Hamas killed over 1,200 innocent civilians, took over 250 hostages, half of whom are still being held today. Uh, and you continue to see uh, the brutality of Hamas in terms of embedding itself within mosques, schools, hospitals, building a tunnel network underneath Gaza instead of spending money on the citizens that it's purportedly was supposed to help govern. A tunnel network, oh, by the way, that's the size of New York City and goes multiple levels uh, below the surface. So again, when it comes to the death of any civilian, from a Department of Defense standpoint, that's absolutely not something we want to see, and this is something that we constantly, uh, repeatedly, publicly and privately uh, discuss with our Israeli counterparts. I think this is also why it's vital that this ceasefire uh, be signed immediately and that the hostages can be returned so that this war in Gaza can end and innocent civilians can stop suffering, whether they be Palestinian or Israeli. So the, so the, the distinction the real quick, yep. though, on the provocation and so are you saying that the, t the tens of thousands of I, I ethnic russians in the donbass who were killed prior to the war right. that was not a provocation the record high deaths in the west bank that done, wasn't a provocation of hamas yes sir Th thank you general how do you how do you uh, determine that i, I answered a couple question. of uh, questions uh the iranian proxy groups in iraq say they have post their attacks on u.s forces uh but as long as the Imam al Hussein reached for France, and they will resume their attacks uh, as long as the U.S. forces remain in Iraq. Do you have any comment on that? Um, again, look, our relationship uh, with Iraq is a strong one. We're there at the invitation of the government of Iraq, uh, and we'll continue to uh, have the discussions through the Higher Military Commission uh, and through our U.S. Iraq Joint Security Cooperation Dialogue to look at. Uh, not only what the future of the coalition is, um, but also what our longer term uh, U.S.-Iraq bilateral security relationship will be. And so, again, we'll have much more to provide on that in the future. I just don't have any updates to provide right now. And lastly, the deputy head of the Russian Reconciliation Center in Syria stated that an American Typhoon fighter jet approached a uh, Russian aircraft dangerously. Yeah. Do you have any I, I don't have anything on that. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.